Ferrari just released their SF24 and in this video we're going to go from the front to the back of the car going through all the different aerodynamic features on the car and how they work. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19 and 20 Formula 1 seasons and I now work as an aerodynamics consultant designing race car aerodynamics packages for cars in all different categories all around the world. Now those of you that have been here before were probably wondering why I haven't been throwing as many videos out on cars this year and frankly it's because the cars aren't showing up with that many new features. There's not a whole lot going on so I'll try to pick up some of the differences on this particular car that we can talk through, uh, particularly new features that we haven't seen before like the halo winglets and things like that. Uh, and we'll also just talk through some of the, the more generic evolution things that have changed over the cars uh, over this recent 12 month time period. So anyway, let's get to it. Of course, the standard disclaimer as usual applies to this video, which is whilst I'm a professional aerodynamicist, I'm not a magician, uh, and flows on a Formula One car are very complicated and you can't perfectly predict what's going to happen by eye. The best you can do is take an educated guess based off experience and that's largely what I try to do in these videos. So starting at the front, there's not a huge amount that's changed, but there are a few little details that I'd like to point out. The first is that if you just look across the main surface of the wing here, we're missing those outwashing bobs that used to sit on the top of the wing here that would have given a little bit of uh, an outwash boost along the wing, so a little bit more sideways uh, flow along there, and also should have shared a little bit of vorticity that might have provided outwash further downstream. Those are now gone and what we have is a far more conventional arrangement of slot gap separators and these little swan neck sky hooks. Now why have they switched and ditched those little veins? Well it, it's quite possible they just weren't an efficient option. Any sort of uh, vein or any device of that nature that's shedding vorticity or even just uh, a shedding sort of boundary layer or any losses is going to create drag on the, the car. Uh, and if the downforce benefit or the management benefit isn't outweighing that, that drag penalty, well then you're going to take it off the car. Uh, so that's quite possibly a reason as to why they got rid of those. The wing profile's curvature has gone through a few little tweaks, but nothing earth shattering, so I don't really want to discuss that too much. It does look like we might have moved to a detached uh, element configuration from the end plate, much like Mercedes uh, used to favor in previous years. Uh, this wasn't what the car launched with last year. I'm unsure whether or not it picked some of this up mid-season, but it certainly didn't have it at the start of the year. The other notable change is the front nose has gotten a lot fatter, and I'll go and bring up a, a bit of a comparison picture for this one. If you have a look here, this is the launch spec comparison for last year and this year, and you'll see that the nose is significantly wider here. It also, when you look inside view, is a lot more bulbous in this particular region. It puffs up quite a lot. Uh, so there's a few things that could be going on here. The first thing is that by widening this nose section, there's no porosity through this nose section, unlike a wing. So often you can get some decent loading underneath the nose. And I'll talk a little bit about the side profile in a sec, uh, but they could be trying to get a little bit more load from the nose itself with this wider nose. That's one thing that could be going on. Uh, another is the, the stagnation from this area, this big bulbous area in the front here. Uh, should theoretically increase the, the load and the circulation around this, this front element in the center line. Uh, it's probably not the most efficient trade to just use this for stagnation, but maybe they found other benefits if that was in fact what they were chasing there. And then of course we have to consider that the nose itself is a structural component, uh, not just in terms of holding up the front wing, but also this whole section here is essentially part of your forward crash structure because when you hit a wall, that's what's going to take uh, all the energy out of an impact if you go nose in first. So there are structural components in this and perhaps there was a, an additional advantage uh, to having this wider nose from a crash perspective. It's worth noting that usually aerodynamics will take precedent over something like that and the teams will just make the structure work. Obviously they could because they had a narrow nose before, but maybe there was a secondary advantage in that. If you have a look at this particular side shot, you can kind of see how bulbous this section is here. So you can see it's really quite quite bulky, but you can also see how high up the nose here pulls. It's, it's not exactly sitting like flat and low. I think you can go lower than this in the legality box if I'm not mistaken, but it kicks up quite high. So I think that they probably are extracting a reasonable amount of load for the nose center line. Of course, it's always a little bit of a compromise because if you widen the nose, you're narrowing the wing. So obviously this particular point here has to move outboard when you widen the nose. Uh, so it's not all free. 
but you can sometimes just get more load from the nose itself than from the inboard wing elements. It's worth noting as well that uh, there will be some vorticity shed off this junction through here. Now that vorticity, maybe it's beneficial to push it a little bit further outboard and of course widening the nose would likely do that to those structures. Now going back to this front on shot, I want to address this trend that seems to be emerging on quite a few cars across the grid, which is to have this very sloped barge board that has the top really quite far outboard. So we're getting quite far outboard with this particular point out here. And to me, that's reflective of them getting better and better wake control in this mid wake region. Um, so basically they're, they're obviously getting better pressurization with new side pod designs and things like that in this particular region over here. Uh, and that's going to force the mid wake of the tire. So this is on the back side of the tire, the mid wake will be forced outboard. And that's going to give them more and more room to push this barge board top outwards. Uh, you generally speaking wouldn't want to put your barge board directly in the center of your, your tire wake. Um, so I'm going to guess that as they have developed more and more, the cars, not just the Ferrari, but across the grid, uh, it's made this particular approach more and more profitable. Obviously they still keep the bottom in tight. Um, that would help with the sort of mid lower wake. So the wake that's down here on the tire, this would help with the pressure just in here because they're cranking up this, this, uh, face by bringing this edge inboard uh, and that would allow us to generate more outwash, more suppression of the lower wake, more pressure down low. And so that's obviously something that Ferrari is targeting with this quite heavily angled barge board, but they are not the only ones on the grid to be going for this particular approach. And when we compare back to their previous year's car, they didn't have this as extreme, but it was still there to a smaller extent. Now, speaking of that improved mid-wake suppression uh, and improved mid-wake outwash, we really need to talk about the undercut. Now, this is an area where we are starting to see quite a lot of convergence across the grid in terms of what's going on with the general forward side pod region. Now, I have explained uh, how this particular style of side pod works on my Red Bull video from last year, but we can run through a little bit of the basics and what's going on here. So what we've got down the bottom is we have last year's Ferrari at launch spec, and then at the top, we have this year's Ferrari at launch spec. Now, one of the main differences in the side pod is that you'll note that we have this lip here is up significantly higher than this lip here. And as you'll also note, the top lip is missing. There is no top lip uh, on this particular car. It's moved rearwards to back to here. This is something that Red Bull had last year and most of the cars that have been releasing so far this year are running this or something similar. Now basically the gist that I talked about in the Red Bull video is that if you pull this top lip of the side pod rearwards, what happens is, is that it allows you to bring the lower lip upwards without completely blocking off your inlet. Basically the air will flow down over the top and in uh, without you having to have both lips forwards. Now there's a legality constraint here that's getting in your way and I'll demonstrate on the 3D what's going on. If you can imagine, there's a box that basically stops your side pod going above this height here. So if I had an inlet down here, say, and I wanted to move it up, I could only move it up until the top edge hit the top of that legality box. Once we're there, we can't go any higher. So if I want to keep the same inlet area, I am limited on where my lower lip can get to. Now this is compounded by the fact there is a legality box that essentially follows this angled section here. So you can't go outside this. So if you want to increase your inlet area, you can't just go wider if you want to stay as far forward as possible, which you probably do to suppress the wake as best as possible. So you can't go uh, any further outboard and you get limited on intake area by how high you can push your top and therefore your bottom ends up getting pegged down low. Now, once you take this lip rearwards back here, you can see that we get this sort of full size side pod inlet opening, uh, but we get it further rearwards and then we can use the lower lip of the side pod to essentially create this downwashing wing edge around here. So we get that nice downwashing lip that will give us uh, a good degree of pressurization down here and that pressurization will propagate forwards and help with pushing all the wake out. It will also, as previously discussed, help with improving any attachment on the downwash of the, the top floor surface. And Ferrari does run a fairly high floor inlet. So this would be quite a beneficial feature. So we're controlling a whole bunch of stuff over here. Of course, the higher you raise this inlet, 
the more pressure you'll generate because you're essentially increasing the angle of attack of this whole section. But Ferrari hasn't just raised the height of their inlet. They've done a few other little things while they're in here. One of the things that aerodynamically was always a bit strange on last year's Ferrari was the cis bulge. So basically what happens is that there's a side impact structure located in the side pod. You can choose the height within a certain bound, uh, but it is located somewhere in the side pod uh, and there's another one on the floor. And Ferrari's one was in a certain spot where it had to poke uh, through their overall side pod shape. And it's, generally speaking, when you have a bulge like this, it's aerodynamically suboptimal. But what they've managed to do with this year's car is they've obviously done some work to relocate the side impact structure, which is not a small task because it does require a lot of reinforcement behind it uh, onto the main uh, mono of the car to make sure that you can take the forces involved in side impact. But they've managed to relocate it such that they can now have a really nice smooth profile through here. And this really looks a lot better. Now with all that in mind, what they've done is that they've basically lifted up this whole area down here and they've lifted that area up and been able to increase the, the sort of undercut through this particular region through here compared to the old car, which really went quite wide here. Um, and that width on the old car probably gave it a lot of stagnation pressure at the front, um, but perhaps caused some compromises on flow cleanliness to the rear. Whereas when you undercut that little bit more, you'll get better and better flow cleanliness. Now these are of course the launch specs that were being compared. Midway through the season, there was a little bit of a revision uh, on the old Ferrari's bodywork, but I'm largely just gonna talk about the launch specs here. Basically with the new car though, we've taken this whole side pod area and lifted that up. We still look like we've got plenty of room uh, to be packaging stuff around in this particular car, but this should ensure pretty good flow quality along the floor and also that decently high stagnation here to manage the tire wake. Perhaps they also found value in just lifting the location of that high pressure region. Uh, perhaps the teams aren't just finding an increase in the magnitude of this region is effective, but also lifting it in height might be more beneficial in terms of the wake management. So that might be why we're seeing more of this trend across the grid. And here's just a shot from that rear three quarters, just highlighting that undercut that I was talking about where they've got this really nice smooth line through here. So there should be minimal losses along here because the air's not having to sort of curve out and around. So it's not having to do this action. It can just sort of flow more smoothly through there. So we should have good cleanliness there while still maintaining that stagnation pressure uh, and that bulk outwash and bulk wake management from the sort of fatter uh, forward side pod uh, in the upper region. Now the floor edge, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about because both on the renders uh, and the images of the car on track, it looks not dissimilar to what they were running last year. But what I do want to talk about more is the bodywork, uh, particularly in the upper rear section. Uh, and this is something that's changed a bit since last year. And I've got some comparison shots of last year to just talk through those changes. Uh, so what we have at the top is we have launch spec of this year, launch spec of last year. And then down the bottom, we have some end of season specs of the car down here and here. Now, at the, the start of the year last year, they ran this uh, sort of, I think it was getting the name of the bathtub uh, setup, where basically their bodywork stayed high, looped around here, and was quite disconnected from the floor up high. Um, we were obviously getting some, some flows coming around the bodywork and in, but we weren't sort of getting these top down flows going, getting drawn towards the floor. As we progressed further through the year, uh, what happened was they started to introduce these downwashing features on the sides of the bodywork. So you can just see there, I'm just going to change color. So you can see that downwash coming through there, but we still had very much the same sort of concept. It was just a little bit tweaked with, with the edge downwashing. This year they've gone for a setup that's much more aligned with uh, a number of other cars on the grid, which is sort of having this, this trough region in here. Uh, that goes down and connects to the floor. And you can see from this forward shot just how it dives down here. And it's actually, it's inside this big sidewall. So basically you have this big sidewall along here that goes on the floor here. And then imagine that you have this, this slide diving down here and then meeting with the top of the floor back here. And what I'd imagine that this setup would probably do is, is that the sidewall would probably help keep any tire wake that's been pushed out would to start with, it would probably help keep it sideways while you continue to draw in clean air from the top, down over the top and into the, the floor. You probably keep this uh, wake out here so it crashes more or less into the rear tire instead of going inwards into the diffuser. Um, so we're not really 
in washing at the rear, we're not drawing that weight back in, but we are still down washing the clean air at the top. So I imagine that that's what this setup is more or less doing. And there's there's other cars on the grid that run this setup. Uh, Aston Martin springs to mind as, as one that's quite heavily run this setup before. And if we carry on through to the rear, what we can see is that we have a little bit of a difference higher up as well, where what we have is that uh, on the previous year's car, we had this sort of tight rear end. So everything came in quite, quite narrow. We sort of had a tubular section through here. Whereas now they've gone for a setup that again is more common across the grid where you end up with this wider exit through here. That's your wider cooling exit. So you have the side pods ramp down to the floor. The cooling exit sits there. Uh, and basically what you have is you have this downwashing section of upper bodywork. So we've got this big flat section here and it just downwashes at the end. And that downwash is going to get a good level of downwash onset onto your rear wing, which can often be quite efficient to have some downwash ahead of the rear wing to just load that wing a bit harder uh, in quite an efficient manner. And this is a style that most of the grid seems to be going for these days. While we're back here, it's also worth noting that I'm relatively pleased that I wasn't completely insane when in the first season of these regs I declared that the single element beam wing was all you needed to work because everyone uh, that year proceeded to turn up with dual element beam wings. But it does seem that these days the single element beam wing is, is coming into style. Uh, this was a shot from their last year's beam wing. Uh, and you can see this year's beam wing seems to be more of the same. Maybe it's more cranked, but it looks pretty similar to me. Another interesting little detail that I want to address is these new little details popping up on the side of the halo. Now, the area around the halo in this general region is uh, something that has been explored by quite a few teams, including Ferrari, um, where we often get to see a few little devices pop up in this little legality box where they're allowed a little bit of geometrical freedom in this area just next to the cockpit. So let's talk through what this little winglet could potentially be doing. Now, most devices around the cockpit region, generally speaking, are there to deal with some form of cockpit loss. Imagine you've got a big open cutout here where the cockpit is. You've also got the stagnation of the driver's helmet. And so there's a degree of loss that's always trying to spill out of the cockpit now. Often this spills sort of over and around here, around the halo, but you can get some losses spill out and around the front, particularly in, in yawed conditions. Another thing to note though is, is that there's not necessarily always cockpit losses in here. Again, this is going to be massively design specific, uh, but you could end up with this particular region where there's a rounded corner coming around uh, sort of where the driver's uh, head side impact foam comes up. You've got this, this rounded corner here where you could be getting some losses off that. Uh, now, in terms of what this particular winglet could be doing with respect to everything that's going on there. Imagine that we have cockpit loss trying to escape from here out. If we add pressure with this winglet, so this winglet is essentially in washing, it's trying to pull the flow that way. If we add pressure here, what we can do is gonna make an unfavorable pressure gradient for this loss to escape and it will push the loss inwards a little bit more. So that might help suppress the loss, keep some of it inside the actual cockpit. So that's one thing it could be doing. The other thing it could be doing is that it could be essentially acting as almost a sort of uh, slat or maybe more accurately a support element to this corner here where imagine that for, from above the view is that we've got this corner like this going along uh, and then basically what we're doing is we're going to make a little winglet like that. So let's say that before the winglet it was starting to separate along here so this is the, the, the cockpit flows are coming in here. We round this corner, we're starting to separate, get some losses around this corner. It'll probably be something quite localized, but anyway, could be a small loss. So we add this inwashing element here and that could potentially clean up this loss here, make it so that it's just that little bit cleaner around that corner. Things like this usually aren't game changers. They aren't gonna make huge numbers, uh, but it could just be a nice little tidy up, whether that's the cockpit loss or whether that's uh, improving the flows around that particular corner. And that is my analysis of the SF24. Well, that's all for this analysis video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me. And hopefully, I'll see you next time.